Now, when you went down there, uh, people in Melbourne said, uh, people in Australia, all punters said this horse couldn't possibly win. He hadn't raced for seven weeks, mm -hmm. which was uh, at a time when most horses who ran in the Melbourne Cup ran on the preceding Saturday, only three or four days before. Mm -hmm. um, your horse stepped off the plane and from memory, he didn't do a great deal of work when he first got there. No, he, he didn't travel that well and um, he lost quite a bit of weight. He was dehydrated and uh, it was a case of just creeping back in and um, just getting him rehydrated and um, just, as I said, getting his weight back on, basically. In the straight, it's Tiago Nick by a length. Frontier Boy second, Marrakis the third, three lengths away far. Then the Phantom Finish Crop is running on him in drum taps. Down to the 300, Tiako Nick a length in front of Frontier Boy. Three away, Vintage Crop starting to storm home from Tennessee Jack. Tiako Nick in front, Vintage Crop is storming home on the outside. Vintage Crop on the outside, grabs Tiako Nick then Mercator. And the Cup is going back to England. And Vintage Crop has won the Melbourne Cup. And the horse himself, he was, he was a pretty special horse, wasn't he? Ah, he was a special horse. Yeah, you're down then to the individual. What wins these races is horses with guts and courage and character and soundness. And that's what he had. Uh, he had a heart as big as a lion. Uh, he, was, he was a wonderful horse. And uh, tough as teak and genuine as they come. He was sixth in the champion hurdle as well. He ran in three Melbourne Cups. He was first and he was third. He was also seventh in, in, in a Melbourne mm. Cup when I think he had one of the most uh, horrific pre-race accidents I've seen for a while. And he, he sort of ripped his leg on a, on a fence. No, he was very unfortunate. Just as he was going out to work on the track, there was a little a wind got up and a number of leaves with some papers in it suddenly, like a gush, came up in front of him. And he dived away from this little whirlwind of leaves and papers and caught the side of a post or a rail just as he was going out and unfortunately it wasn't covered and there was a steel or an iron point sticking out and he caught it and uh, on his forearm and uh, he necessitated I think about a dozen stitches. And at the time um, it wasn't um, it wasn't bleeding uh, that badly uh, but I remember distinctly you said to Dave Phillips who I think was uh, yes, sure. with the horse he said, go out and work him straight away. Yeah, we wanted to, if we're going to hope to run the race, well, we have to go, and, and we decided to go then and do our, one of those decisions you make. Maybe it was right, maybe it was wrong, but it, that was the decision we made because from then on, um, you know, we could do very little with the horse. I personally think it cost us the race. And indeed, while he was a brilliant winner of the race when he won, uh, when he was third, coming back the following year with top weight, uh, he put up an amazing performance coming from nearly last to be third, just beaten by um, Dream was nothing like Dane, J just beat him about a length. But he put in a superb performance. I remember Mick Canan saying after, the, uh, after his experiences down there that there are very few horses who give everything in a race, mm -hmm. and this was one of them. That's very true, and that's what he was, an amazing, amazing horse that gave 110%. Another horse that you took down there won four Irish St. Ledgers uh, and he just got touched off in a Melbourne Cup and I think he was fourth in another year, Vinny Rowe. Vinny Rowe was a, was a lovely horse to train, as I said, uh, to win the classic four years in, in succession uh, was quite an achievement for him. And um, he was unlucky not to win a Melbourne Cup. He was probably the best horse I brought down that didn't win a Melbourne Cup. He was trying to give weight uh, to Mackie Vidiva and the first year she beat him in neck. I think got a run right around the inside. But anyway, uh, no, Vinnie Rowe was a very special horse. And then, of course, we had Vinnie Rowe and Media Puzzle another year. And that was one of my most enjoyable moments in horse racing was watching those two horses turning into the straight in Flemington in the Melbourne Cup and knowing at that stage that they were going to fight it out because they'd drawn clear. And. Uh, the weight concession, I think it was 12 pounds, that Vinnie Rowe was giving to Media Puzzle just told the tale. And unfortunately, as Vinnie, Pat had to commit Vinnie Rowe to challenge Damien on Media Puzzle. And he just got run out of second and third just in the shadow of the post. But Media Puzzle was a very good winner and got a very, very good ride from Damien Oliver. 
And, and when, when you went down there with Media Puzzle, he wasn't even in the field, was he? He wasn't qualified. No, we had to qualify him, but I was reasonably confident that we would. So we went for the Geelong Cup, which he won very easily. And then, of course, as you know, we had the... Um, with Damien Oliver losing his brother and the decision whether he would ride Media Puzzle in the Cup or not. And um, fortunately for all concerned, he decided to ride the horse and the rest is history. Uh, it was a, a traumatic, obviously traumatic week for the, for the family. But you as, uh, you as the trainer, uh, you, were, you were drawn into that trauma as well. Yeah, we were indeed. I think even in the movie The Cup, it's, it's uh, Brendan Gleeson plays me. I think he's, he, he portrays it very well. Like as I made it very clear when I got off the plane, when I was being questioned by all the media, you know, what was, I, I just said that, that um, really like horse racing was very secondary in, the, in life. The important things was how Damien felt having had the tragic loss of his brother, having lost his father as well. And uh, I said he should be given time and space to uh, make his decision. Then they always asked, you know, what are the jockey if you got stand by? I said, I've nobody standing by. I'm, I'm not bringing anybody from Europe. I'm not naming any other Australian jockey. I just wait and see what Damien decides to do. And then we'll make a decision. And according to Damien, when he actually saw that interview, it helped him to make the decision to ride the horse. It was a happy ending with the... With the uh... It was a wonderful ending. and. Um, it was just very special to come back and win another Melbourne Cup because, you know, you'd always get people to say that it was a fluke and that whatever a vintage crop uh, was, but vintage crop was born in really high-class horse. And uh, like he won two Irish St. Ledger's, beating the neck for the Gold Cup at Oscar when he didn't really get that trip. And um, first horse in this country to win over a million Irish pounds. But media puzzle really blossomed in Australia. And uh, he was very hard to beat on that day on very fast ground. He looked a different horse, didn't he, Dan? Well, he loved the sunshine. He loved the sunshine. And he, he, Media Puzzle loved fast ground and warm weather. And he excelled in both cups that he won down there. Dermot, you're 66. You've been training for more than four decades. But it strikes me, there's, uh, one thing that strikes me is that you, you seem to be just as hungry as ever. I don't know, but um, yeah, if you're in a business and you want to do well, you've, you've, you've got to be hungry, you've, you've got to be ambitious, you know what I mean? That's why I, do, I enjoy doing it. I'm not one of those persons that sets out mark and say, oh, I want to achieve this or I want to achieve that. I'm very happy with what I'm doing, how I'm going. Our horses are running exceptionally well and uh, we're winning a lot of races, a lot of major races, and I just want to keep doing that. We're Maybe next year we might be fortunate to hit the 4,000 winner mark. And, um, yeah, you know, but we'll, as, as I said, I'm, I don't have set out targets that I want to achieve a certain thing by a certain date. I just like to take each day as it comes. I remember once you were saying that you, the international side of it was what really did appeal to you mm. a lot. And you, mm. you've been to Australia, you've won the, the biggest race there twice, you've been to Hong Kong, you were... One of the very first winners of a race yeah. there. Yeah, Hong Kong uh, was interesting, Jim, in that we were the first to go to Hong Kong. And in those days, there was just two international races. And uh, we brought two horses, one for what was then the Hong Kong Vals and the Hong Kong Cup. And um, additional risk, uh, set the track record with Michael Canaan, wrote a brilliant race on him to win the Hong Kong Vals. And then we ran a horse called Prudent Manor, and he was second in the Hong Kong Cup. So. We were the first to um, go into Hong Kong, and uh, yeah, it was it was uh, it was great days. You've also been to the States. You've you've conquered a leg of the of the American Triple Crown. One place that you did mention that you I don't think you've you've been there yet is South America, and the Carlos Pellegrini was the race that you always yeah, used to talk was, about. That was, is that still on the book? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I think so. I don't think so. It was. It was. But I did. We looked at running in the Carlos Pellegrini, and then <laughs> I think there was a war or something got in the way, Jim. <laughs> and uh, I think the prize money and the cost of getting there were were uh, prohibitive. And of course, I looked at South Africa as well, but uh, with African horse sickness and uh, quarantine problems. Uh, That'll all happen in time, you know what I mean? Those things will all happen in, 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 in the years to come. And 
as I said, no, we've been fortunate racing across America. We've had good grade one winners, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, uh, matriarchs, secretariats, flower bowls, you know what I mean? We've, we've been very fortunate and uh, just hope we, could, we can keep doing it. That's, that's basically it. But I do enjoy the international aspect. I've always believed that the future of racing was on an international basis and uh, now everybody's doing it, so, you know. But Dermot, they think nothing of doing it, but they're not always successful. And we've seen it with a, a number of horses that go from Australia here uh, or go to the States. There's always this ongoing debate, should you run them off the plane or should you get, should you get there early, uh, yeah. a couple of weeks early? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What have you concluded over the years? Well, well, that debate will always hold. And I really think it's down to the horse. I think it's down to the individual. Uh, I ideally... For America, I like to go five or six days before the race. Um, I do think there's a, whatever you want to call it, a jet lag or something that, that maybe two weeks is not ideal. So for me, five or six days is ideal for America. But again, it's down to the individual horse. And do you see when horses travel long distances, they, they can have one run and then their next run, they, they, they might uh, deteriorate? In yeah, form. that's 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 pretty standard. That's and what why, I would and, expect. And, and why, why would that be? Well, again, this is the <laughs> there's a lot of reasons for that. You, you know what I mean? There's the atmospheric circumstances. There's a change of food, change of water. You know what I mean? Change of environment. And and uh, so that's 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 basically it. So even though more people are taking on the challenge, mm -hmm. the the task is still just as great to get it right. Oh yeah, the task will always be there to get it right. Yeah, it will. It doesn't matter whether it's now or in a hundred years' time. I would hope in a hundred years' time, as technology improves, as knowledge improves, and uh, then of course they'll have it down to a fine art. We don't yet, but we're learning.